Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello, everyone. And we have a special guest with us today, Melissa Kirscher. Hello! How are you, Melissa? Welcome! (laughs) I'm doing well. (laughs) Hooray! So why don't you tell people who you are, what you do, where they can find you? I am Melissa Kirscher. I am a podcaster at Real Education and Real Education Noir, both available at (laughs) realedu.com and realedunoir.com. Real spelled as R-E-E-L because we are clever like that. I am a local film historian and just movie nerd and (laughs) watching Slow Burn, I know why you asked me on. (laughs) Yes, yes. Has absolutely no ties to your noir podcast. Absolutely at all. none whatsoever, none. which means everything <laughs> is tied to my noir podcast. Yes. Your round now is we typically ask our guests what is your history with and thoughts on Joel Schumacher, but this isn't really a Joel Schumacher film, but we'll go ahead and ask you anyways. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. What is your overall view and exposure to Joel Schumacher? Well, being a teenager when I saw Lost Boys and heavily into the Corey and Corey thing at the time, and to the point of somehow convincing my mother to name my younger brother Corey. Ah. Wow. Yeah, right? <laughs> I was a big fan of Lost Boys when it came out. So on that side, I like Joel Schumacher, but I'm not a fan of what happened with Batman later. Sure. But, you know, it's kind of a love-hate relationship. I'm not a fan of Phantom of the Opera. But he has in so general. many things outside of Batman and Phantom of the Opera. Well, yes, I know, I know. I saw Flatliners in the theater, and mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that, and forgot about it for about twenty years until you mentioned it. It was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I believe we have you scheduled for that one. So, oh sweet, yes, oh, that would be great. And yeah, he's had his high points and low points in his career. Okay, well, we'll see how you enjoy Flatliners when we get to that. So. <laughs> So we're covering today the 1986 TV movie Slow Burn, which I'm guessing none of us had ever seen before. No. 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 I think it made it to VHS and has been out of print so long that even this film on VHS garners like a $200 price tag on Amazon. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I literally just found it broken in seven parts on YouTube and that's what we watched. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, just getting into a little bit of history on Slow Burn. After writing a pair of sensational books about the dangers of rising Satanism in America. Oh my God. Mm. Yes. Wow. Oh, th- oh yes. this has so much more context. <laughs> yes. Arthur Lyons decided to keep writing fiction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> da, da, da. And he debuted the character of Jacob Ash in 1974. The series would run for 11 novels until 1994, and Lyons would only write a few other books before passing away in 2008. Slow Burn is adapted from the fourth book in the series, Castle's Burning, which was released in 1980. I did read the novel and prep for this. I'll bring it up again later in the show, just kind of covering some of the differences. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now, Joel Schumacher neither wrote nor directed this movie. Right. But we're talking about it here because he only has, I want to say, three or four projects that he was only a producer on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he was ever attached to direct this, and that's how his name is on it. But regardless, he's an executive producer on the finished film. Slow Burn was written and directed by Matthew Chapman during a period of drama thrillers which include Hussy, Stranger's Kiss, and Heart of Midnight. Oh my. Which was followed by an extended break where he wouldn't direct again until 2011 with The Ledge. (laughs) (laughs) But during this time, he also wrote screenplays for Consenting Adults, Color of Night, What's the Worst That Could Happen, and Runaway Jury, which is an interesting credit because Joel Schumacher was initially attached to direct that movie. So I don't know if there's a tie there. Chapman is also the great-great-grandson of Charles Darwin and has written several humorous books about Darwinism. Hmm. Humorous books? Yes. So we've got... That wacky Darwinism. So we've got Darwinism and Satanism. Yeah. Okay. Involved in the origins of this movie, so... Why not? I Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. So the actual main <laughs> onset producer of Slow Burn was Mark Levinson in the early half of only a 15 year run of films, which include Teen Wolf, Mystic Pizza, Big Man on Campus, Home Alone, and The Philadelphia Experiment Part Two. <laughs> Yeah. I have a great love of Teen Wolf for some reason. What's surprising is almost the entire crew of this worked on Teen Wolf, which was the film they did like right before this. Really? Yeah. Interesting segue. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> okay. But my brain is spinning at the moment. <laughs> and it will more? <laughs> yeah. And also, most of them also did Big Man on Campus. You know, yeah, the hunchback well, of Notre Dame on college. <laughs> that, that I can see. That I can see. Yeah. I understand Trying to recapture that, that Teen Wolf glory. <laughs> <laughs> so... The, so this film was produced for MCA and Universal for Showtime. Showtime had already been around for a decade, but this was during a period of time when MCA and Universal had just bought Showtime, but were still stuck in the middle of a years-long legal battle with the courts because they bought Showtime and the movie channel. Yeah. So they were stuck in the courts over whether or not they gave them a monopoly. Mm -hmm. But during this time, they saw a kick in original productions and they made a bunch of TV movies. And this was also when they debuted It's Gary Shandling's show mm -hmm. and Shelley Duvall's Fairy Tale Theater. I remember that. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know if this was meant to be a pilot for additional Jacob Ash mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were, because this was the era of a lot of big mystery TV movies. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, I remember this era of TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely yeah. fitting that era of Hunter and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> and Showtime movies of this era, you know, they were kind of cheaply made. Mm. This was still a couple years before Red Shoe Diaries. Yeah, but definitely very, very much still leading up to that. Yeah. On a final note, I don't know if this series was part of a deal that Joel Schumacher had with Universal, but Universal had also produced Codename Foxfire, the TV series that he had worked on just a couple years earlier, okay. and both were executive produced by Stephanie Staff and Cole, so I'm guessing there was some kind of a tie between the two. Mm. So otherwise, I don't really have any other history on this movie. I tried looking up interviews. All I could find was one interview quote where Johnny Depp mentions, yeah, I liked working with Eric Roberts. He taught me a lot. <laughs> That's it. That's all I could find with people talking about this. Well, movie. this was like Johnny Depp's third role ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm it, sure it's we'll Johnny Depp on, yeah. as a pretty much a very tall child with a cat on his head. Oh, yeah. That was a terrible haircut. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we'll, God. We'll put a pin in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Disgraced journalist turned private eye Jacob Ash is hired to track down the long estranged wife and son of avant garde photographer Gerald McMurdy. The case seems pretty open and shut when Jacob tracks down the wife, Lainey, to a lush home where she's now married to businessman Simon Fleischer, but things take a turn when their teenage son, Donnie, turns out to not be Gerald's boy. That child died long ago in a car accident, the revelation of which sends Gerald violently storming out of a party. Jacob tries to put the case behind him, but he's drawn back in when Gerald turns up missing after having gone to the Fleischer home to confront Lainey. Soon, Donnie goes missing as well, and a call comes in demanding a ransom. The feds begrudgingly keep Jacob around because of his knowledge of McMurdy, but when a money drop goes wrong and is never picked up, both Donnie and McMurdy turn up dead, McMurdy with a confessional suicide note, and the discovery hits Simon with a massive heart attack. Unfortunately, the tragedy isn't so clean cut as Jacob has begun having an affair with Lainey until he learns the son she had with Cheryl died as a result of abuse and the accident was staged to cover it up by Tommy Walsh, who's continuing a long-standing affair with Lainey as well as a teenage friend of Donnie both of whom he's tattooed and keeps supplied with drugs. Jacob's snooping results in him being captured by Tommy, and the entire kidnapping was meant to take out Simon and Donnie so Lainey can inherit the family fortune, and then Tommy can inherit it from her. While Tommy is about to dispose of Jacob in an aqueduct, Lainey shows up and shoots him, sending the killer into the threshing waters instead. Having now earned her fortune, Lainey offers to share it with Jacob if he'll run away with her, but with what he now knows, he can barely even look at her and leaves her to her lonely guilt. It's so noir. Yeah. It is so noir. It is so noir. I actually, it's like, somebody wanted to make their own Chinatown, and here it is. Yes. Mm. Right down to the aqueduct. Oh, yeah. So, Angie, yeah. do you recommend Slow Burn? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, see, like, y'all had to say Chinatown already. So, yeah, like, that's the thing. If you've seen Chinatown and then you watch this, you're like, man, this is a really poor attempt to do that. It's a shame because it does have a really solid cast for the most part, but I just don't find any of these characters interesting, likable, entertaining in any way. <laughs> the mystery, I'll admit I didn't figure it out from the get-go, so there's that, but it still just wasn't like, <gasps> you know, like, no, I just, I didn't really feel much of anything for this movie, honestly. Melissa, do you recommend it? <sighs> 
It is for Eric Robert completists only. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> and I, I expect there are very few of those. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's not enough Johnny Depp in here to seek it out. No. Because he's in the movie for a hot second, and that's about it. And he doesn't have much to do. In a movie where Eric Roberts is literally delivering the best performance. (laughs) Oh, yikes. The guy playing the former husband of Lainey. I have not seen a performance that stilted in a really, really long time. <laughs> the script is mostly, well, early on, like the first third of it is so boilerplate. It's like, you're just going through a checklist, aren't you? It's mm-hmm. like this scene and then this scene. Yep, did this scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to have this scene. There we go. We'll check that off. And there's something about how film noir dialogue translates to anything past about 1955. It takes a lot of skill to pull it off. Mm-hmm. And I will admit that as I watched the rest of the film, you know, past about the halfway point, I kind of got into it. And there are actually some really fun passages. Like whenever the main character does an ode to tequila, I was on board. <laughs> but when you get heavy film noir dialogue, which is very arch, and a lot of that stuff was written before method acting became a thing and kind of before Marlon Brando came on the scene. So performances were kind of arch anyway during those times. And so that dialogue belongs with that style of actor. So do you recommend it? <laughs> like I said, Eric Roberts completed us only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of beasts with it. I will say I don't feel like I wasted my time seeing it, though. I was actually interested and it didn't bore me. So I will give it that. But given it's a movie that's actually kind of hard to track down unless you watch it in seven parts on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, probably not worth your time. Yeah, and I agree. I don't think it's worth the effort. It's one of those ones where it's like, I don't recommend it, but I also don't not recommend it. Again, like if you come across it and you like Noir, you like Eric Roberts, Mm -hmm. God bless you if you're a fan of Dan Hedaya. (laughs) (laughs) Yay, Dan Hedaya. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Now that was a piece of odd casting. Well, and and Henry Gibson wasn't? (laughs) Well, it's not terrible. I think as the story goes along, it does become a little more interesting. It becomes a little harder to outguess the twist. There are a couple of nice performances in there, even beyond Eric Roberts. And Eric Roberts, you know, did have electric charisma. This was like a couple of years after Runaway Train, which was his big yeah. Oscar nominee. Yeah. Mm. And it's not terrible. Again, like if you catch it on TV, yeah, sure, go ahead, give it a try. But again, it's basically on par with your average 80s detective serial. It's on yeah. par with your average episode of a Stephen Cannell or Don Belisario show. Right. Mm-hmm. Its biggest problem is that it feels like a cheap TV movie. It really does. Yep. <laughs> like... <laughs> I don't think they had a sound editor. No. The sound editing was mm-hmm. just atrocious. And again, a lot of the film is just wide medium shots and yeah. Yeah. not much background music. Well, right. and there, when the script does turn interesting, like there's this little set of scenes where they're waiting for the ransom call and all these people are in this big mansion kind of killing time. Like one of the cops is making There's a waffles. lot of sitting around. There's a lot of sitting there around is. and Eric Roberts accidentally breaks a painting that's made out of dishes, which is kind of extraordinary. <laughs> I was watching that going, if this was under the hand of better director, this would be a nice set of scenes. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. what is problematic about the script early on seems to be, like I said, kind of that checklist factor. Of, then this happens, then this happens. It's but your it basic have, setup. Yeah, yeah and it, but it doesn't have any breathing room to like develop character or anything yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. And it's really heavy handed. But once you get to that waiting scene, the movie suddenly gets a little bit of airspace. It's like, yeah. oh, all these characters are thrown together in a mansion and here's what they do to waste their time. It's kind of great. But it's kind of fumbled in that there's weird music laid over it and it's too quickly edited together. Angie, what did you think of Eric Roberts and his character of Jacob Ash? I mean, he was okay because he's not just your typical noir hero. I felt like he was at least trying to bring a little bit more nuance to it. But he was still coming off a bit bland to me overall, honestly. I didn't really feel that he was particularly attracted to Lainey in any way or, <laughs> or even to or, Pam. Or anybody. Oh, that's steaming chemistry. <laughs> no, yeah, like wasn't. there was no chemistry, which I feel like you need for this kind of thing. But they had a nude 80s Showtime sex scene. How can that not have chemistry? Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> awkward. Yeah. So bad. Once again, you kind of see that put together and you go, oh, this was like three years after Body Heat and clearly yeah. they're going mm-hmm. for that. And 
everything is so hot and like Eric Roberts is walking around with sweat stains under his <laughs> You know what, what, what was missing in this movie? Saxophone. <laughs> Yeah, yes. they had bad harmonica, bad electronic <laughs> harmonica yeah. with a guy in the background playing harmonica. Did you notice that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It would astounded me every time I saw it. Yeah, and Eric Roberts, the frustrating thing is there are moments where it's like someone hits the on switch and Eric Roberts mm-hmm. just goes nuts and really is captivating. But yeah, a lot of it is just him sitting around observing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's not even that much of the story of him putting together clues. No. It's basically like, hey, this guy hired me to do this thing. Okay, I did it. Oh, yeah. crap, I made a mistake. Okay, this other guy hired me to do something. I did it. Oh, crap, I made a mistake. <laughs> he's not a very good detective. No. No, he's no. not. And again, they have that interesting backstory of, now he was a journalist mm-hmm. right. who then got arrested because he wouldn't give up a source and now is slumming it as a detective. But it just felt so typical if he just kind of wandered through the movie Mm -hmm. yeah and the backstory is like by the time you get there as a viewer you're like "Eh, don't care we really don't (laughs) and what was interesting about the books is that like the first book he is a journalist and as the books go along you get that story okay of how he falls out of that and then becomes a detective and by this one he's a detective i wonder why they chose to just adapt this one when you don't actually get that build of the character Mm -hmm. beverly d'angelo as laney what did you think of her angie you know, I really like her in other things. I don't know if it's this is direction or script to blame, but once again, like she did not make me feel like she was as conflicted and tortured as this character was clearly supposed to be. Yeah. For a woman who had killed her son in the past and was dealing with that, like she just sort of goes from scene to scene and very, very lazily seduces someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just not really feeling it. I feel like you would have needed an actress who can turn on the menace a little bit mm-hmm. and be steamy and sultry and. Beverly D'Angelo really isn't any of those things. I've always thought of her as kind of a more comedic actress, and she was great at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. here, yeah, she just kind of sleepwalks through it. Yeah, and that's weird because I remember when I first saw this, I'm like, oh, it's a noir starring Eric Roberts and Beverly D'Angelo. I could actually see that working and be something interesting, but it doesn't feel like either one is quite held up to their strengths. No. I mean, I think she has a kind of smoky quality that can work Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a noir, but I don't think the character's written very well. No, it's not. I don't think the scenes are staged very well. Mm -mm, And again, her and Roberts have like zero chemistry. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they had a romance between them, period. Uh, Other than that, uh, somebody felt like in a noir it was required to have a sexy lady that the guy falls for. Well, the femme fatale is a (laughs) long hill true trope of noir, but yeah, I feel like they had to get busy on screen at least once because showtime, Mm -hmm. check sex yeah. scene. <laughs> but yeah. I do kind of like on paper, though, just the layers that are gradually uncovered about the character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She did kill her son. She did fake that death. She is part of this plot to basically get the inheritance of her husband. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know? And the movie ends with basically she wins. It's not even a bittersweet victory. She wins. Yeah. Right. She has all the money now. Everyone else who was a rival to it is dead. And the detective has like nothing he could do to pin it on her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's actually an interesting ending but again by then tying it to the i want you still and run away with me and it's like Mm. i don't get that connection at all no yeah i'm pretty sure they saw body heat and said hey we've got this script that's kind of like body heat yeah Mm -hmm. because body heat was like 82 83 wasn't it yeah right around there yeah Mm -hmm. but again there were a lot of the kind of modern noir ones i know altman was doing Mm -hmm. them we were seeing a lot of more mickey splains and raymond chandler's and all that stuff oh yeah Mm -hmm. you know tv was doing murder she wrote and all sorts of stuff like that yeah Mm -hmm. having a great time with it but another thing that I kept thinking of was Long Goodbye mm. which you mentioned Altman but Elliot Gould being this almost postmodern take on the noir in which he is really ineffectual at his job but yeah. he kind of stumbles through this murder mystery to varying degrees of success so Melissa mm-hmm. Dan Hedaya <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he was doing, he was giving it his all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dan Hedaya, he's fun to watch, but man, was he out of place in this movie as Simon. Oh, my God. Yeah. God, wasn't he? Was... What? My son? No. I, oh, oh, my oh, goodness. No. no, my son. Oh. <laughs> you can understand why he had a heart attack. He was a very extreme guy. I keep going back to him playing Nixon and Dick. <laughs> <laughs> or was it Carla's husband on Cheers? Yeah. Or hell, even the guy in Alien Resurrection where, again, it's like, why is Dan Hedaya here? <laughs> <laughs> 
never question Dan Hedaya. <laughs> and that's the thing. You got to give Dan Hedaya credit. He's always Dan Hedaya. That's true. Yes, I mean, when absolutely. you hire Dan Hedaya, that's what you get. You get 100% Dan Hedaya. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't phoning it in. I'll give him that. Yeah. No. I mean, even during the money drop scene where he's freaking out in the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. He's basically, if you're going to check it out, I feel like he's almost the reason. He definitely makes it entertaining. If you want to watch this in an ironic way, Dan Hedega is fun to watch. Yeah. Just look up his scenes. You'll be entertained for a bit. Yeah. So then there is the brief appearance of Johnny Depp as Donnie. We only get to see him a couple of times and then he's dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's a bit cathartic if you don't like Johnny Depp. Yeah. He probably (laughs) hadn't beaten anybody up yet, right? So there's that. Yeah, I don't think so. But then, yeah, the guy playing Gerald, the photographer, is just... He's atrocious. Mm. And he's an actor who I keep seeing in a lot of stuff, even though he's never good in any of it. (laughs) Someone likes him. <laughs> he was one of those character actors, yeah. Mm. Maybe he was cheap. It could be. It could, could be. be. Oh, and here's something that I found baffling. The guy who played Tommy Walsh is not credited. Hmm. I couldn't figure out who that was or why he wasn't credited. That's weird. It's an important character for the story. You'd think they would include yeah. him. Yeah. I even looked through the credits at the end. He's not listed there. Well, I think it was kind of one of those TV ones where it's like they list the actors, but they don't list everyone by character. Hmm. But he's a major character with lines. Yeah. They even credit by name the woman who's standing there as a model when Eric Roberts first walks into the studio, the woman Mm -hmm. in the bathroom. They credit her with a name, but Tommy Walsh isn't in there. Well, I'm guessing he is one of the actors here who's just not See, I went through them all. They only have one credit in its slow burn. Hmm. Well, and then... What's funny is, you know, you were talking about how this hits all the beats of a mystery. It's like, you know, when you're watching like an episode of Monk or Murder, She Wrote or Psych, where it's like (laughs) pretty much anyone who's introduced in the first 10 minutes is going to be the killer. Mm -hmm. He's just randomly introduced at a party in the first 10 minutes and we never see him again for a while. Yeah. That's such a cheat. Yeah. (laughs) And then he just shows up again later. And then, yeah, Henry Gibson. Who's there to fay it up for a little bit. Who could have been a fun little character, but there's not really much there. Though, Mm -hmm. Angie, what's interesting is there's also the woman at the party. Uh This kind of large, older woman who is like, oh, it's a great show. And you just see her once. Yeah, yeah. That's Pat Ast from Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. Little mini reunion there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And she actually played a prominent role in that, which also had Henry Gibson. Awesome. And Henry Gibson and Pat Ast were also in Incredible Shrinking Woman. So this is our third episode of Schumacast to have Henry Gibson and Pat Ass in the same movie. There's your actual Joel Schumacher connection to this There's film. your actual Schumacher tie. <laughs> So wouldn't it have been great if like Henry Gibson had been the killer and we could have had him third act? Yes. Little Henry Gibson trying to drag Eric Roberts up to the aqueduct. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shooting him up with heroin and dragging yeah. him up. To- yeah. I would have been on board for that. So and then also going back to the Gerald McBurtry character is the weird studio setup for yeah. his photography where he has these yeah. dolls of young boys. There's the weird naked woman just standing around. Well, having been in the art world for a very brief amount of time and that's totally real i do kind of like that punch where after he's dead jacob runs into those characters again and finds Mm -hmm. out oh yeah his art is just selling like hot pockets now yeah because he's dead yeah Yeah. and people think he killed a boy so it makes it even more interesting i'm sure yeah Mm -hmm. i'm trying to think if there's anyone else in the i mean there's the character of pam who's the friend of the johnny depp character Mm -hmm. yeah the young girl she was just kind of an odd character who's hard to get a pin on there's like two scenes where Jacob literally chases her down in the car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in one scene, she's just laughing the entire time and just playing it all off as a joke. And the other time we find out this whole backstory about an abortion and being tied to Tommy and all that stuff. I'm going to guess she's one of the ones that doesn't really have any other roles besides this film because her acting was not very good. No. <laughs> no. No. And I feel like she probably didn't have much to work with on character either. No, I'm sure she didn't. And again, it's like the story is interesting. Mm -hmm. The backstory to the character is interesting. But the actual mechanics of how it's written is not that good. Right. Was the book better written? Would you say? If you want me to go ahead and get into the book, the basic underlying plot is basically the same Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, he's hired to find the son. It all goes bad. Mm -hmm. Then there's this whole kidnap plot and all that stuff. 
But what was fascinating about the book is it gets a lot more into the L.A. culture. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was doing a perfect imitation of Raymond Chandler writing mm-hmm. if it took place in 70s L.A. Nice. Okay. And so actually the Henry Gibson character is a friend of his and is the one who brings him into this case to begin with mm-hmm. and would pop up throughout the story more and more. There's a lot more into the art scene that McMurtry's a part of. The Tommy character is actually a failed actor who couldn't get any roles because he looks so much like one of the leads on Starsky and Hutch that everyone just wanted to cast that guy. (laughs) And a large part of the plot is uncovered by Jacob Ash pretending to be an agent trying to get this guy into a role. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> so it gets a lot more into LA culture and right. acting and art scene. and That would have yeah. been better. So Pam is a very different character in the books where she only has one scene where she kind of reveals that Donnie had a drug problem and was hanging out with this rough group of kids. Mm. And Jacob tracks down this group of kids. And you actually get a really great hard-boiled scene where he's beating the shit out of these junky kids who try to kill him. Mm-hmm. And finds out that Tommy is their drug supplier. Okay. And then it's finding out then that Tommy has this previous history with Lainey mm-hmm. and then putting all those pieces together. There's not this whole bit of the tattoo and he's sleeping with all these, but actually in the book, Jacob and Lainey never have a relationship. Good. That's better. Yeah. You still find out all this backstory on her, but she does get busted by the cops in the end. But yeah, there's no sexual relationship between them at all. And even just the whole Tommy and Jacob sequence at the end is a lot grittier with like a whole scene where he drugs Jacob and then Jacob comes to and Tommy's basically beating his knees in with a lead pipe while asking him what he knows. (laughs) It's like the whole torture scene in Casino Royale. Mm -hmm. You know, you just think it's going to go terribly. And then, of course, he's going to throw him into the aqueduct and all that stuff. Lainey doesn't play a part in that at all. Jacob gets thrown into the aqueduct but manages to snag something, pulls himself out, and then throws the other guy into the aqueduct. And actually, the guy almost climbs out too, and he tries to help him out. But then the machinery kicks on and he gets sucked in. Mm -hmm. I think they said they found his body four months later, or at least the parts of it that were left. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's specifically an aqueduct, but it's basically the entrance to a water processing plant where everything's just going to get torn up and run through filters and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. The book was not bad. I mean, it was a little bland, but again, it's like as the story went along, it started to get more and more interesting, a little grittier and a little harder. Mm -hmm. And I think the movie is, it's a decent adaptation, but it changes things for reasons I don't know why. Like again, a lot of the opening is, now it's Mona who's introducing him to Gerald and bringing him into the story. And it's just the specifics of it are kind of moved around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't really understand why Mona even had to be a character. No. Like she didn't really play much of a role overall. You didn't need her and the Henry Gibson character. You could have just had one or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the whole thing of him pretending to be an ethics professor. (laughs) What are ethics? Yeah. Good question, Johnny. Good question. Yeah. Oh, that should be a gift now. (laughs) What are ethics? Johnny Depp asking me what are ethics. There are some lines that I did like out of the script. When he gets punched at the party, it's like, it's okay, he's used to it. Yeah. Or, like I said, anytime he writes an ode to tequila, I was there. <laughs> now, Angie, I gotta ask you, mm-hmm. since we've been doing this project, yeah. do you think this would have worked better had Joel done it? Hmm. I think it at least would have looked better. It would have looked a lot Yeah, it better. certainly would have looked better. I feel like the only similar film he had done so far was Virginia Hill, which is certainly mm. not a good comparison <laughs> not no. to make. At least he would have tighter source material with this one. Right. I mean, and I think he had certainly grown as a director since that project. The romance probably still would have been awkward because at least so far he has not nailed down that angle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean... I would have at least liked to have seen it. I feel like, given what you've told me about the novel, I feel like somebody a little more adept could have made a better version of this film, for sure. So, startling fun fact. The cinematographer of this movie also did Little Miss Sunshine. Hmm. Interesting. Really? Yeah. Huh. Really? Yeah. Tim Surstedt. He's a very prominent cinematographer on comedies, and he also shot Teen Wolf. Oh, that, well, that doesn't surprise me. Office Space. Oh. Idiocracy. Huh. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Oh, really? The Hot Chick. Oh. And Movie 43. 
Oh. Yeah. So he is a very, very, I mean, he has like over a hundred movie credits. Yeah. Wow. But it's just interesting then like Little Miss Sunshine was a beautifully shot movie. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Budget in this case, I guess, maybe. And I'll be honest, there are like a few moments that I like in this. Mm-hmm. You know, like, mm-hmm. especially during like the big chase to drop off the money scene and a couple things here and there. But it's like a large part of this is just shot really flatly like a TV episode. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, one of the things I really did like, it had its moments. Yeah. Like when they drop off the money and morning comes and all the sprinklers come on and the sunrise and there's the money just getting soaking wet and the lawn sprinklers and it occasionally had moments Mm -hmm. occasionally occasionally yeah but otherwise it's really cut and dried i really wonder if it was like we got a week to shoot this thing let's go 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 and there just wasn't much time to work on anything could be one other credit that stood out to me is the production designer on this is bo welsh Bo Welsh did most of Tim Burton's movies in the 80s. Oh, okay. He then went on to Barry Sonnenfeld. Interesting. So, I mean, the production designer of this is the guy who did Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands and the Men in Black trilogy and Batman Returns Mm -hmm. and Little Princess, even. Even Thor, and he is currently doing the Netflix series of Unfortunate Events series, which he's also a director on. He also is the director. His directorial debut is the Mike Myers Cat in a Hat. Interesting. Was this an early (laughs) job for him? Yeah. I think this was right around Beetlejuice, right before Beetlejuice. So this was his Virginia Hill then. (laughs) 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 This is getting your foot in the door. That's what this is. Well, I suspect I can see strains of his style in the weird art pieces. And, you know, every once in a while, like the woman in the trailer park has that giant dog statue on her porch, (laughs) which I did right in my nose. It's like, I want that dog statue. (laughs) Or the mansion just had some weird ceramic flowers on the table, stuff like that i mean mm-hmm. i can kind of see the larger than life yeah. sort of aspects yeah. yeah this is his fourth credit and then the movie he did right after this was the lost boys mm-hmm. okay i kind of want that giant painting made out of broken dishes <laughs> oh he also did joe versus the volcano <gasps> joe versus the volcano i love so much i still need to see it oh i have such sights to show you <laughs> But yeah, it's just... It's so delightful. You get the production designer who did like Tim Burton and Barry Sonnenfeld movies. Mm. You get the cinematographer of Little Miss Sunshine. And this is the best the film turns out. Yeah. Yeah. And even looking at like other crew, it's like the art director on this is currently doing all the Marvel movies. Yeah. You know, the set decorator on this did all the Coen Brother movies. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting just seeing that this was like a stepping stone for a lot of people who would go on to do a lot of great work. They just weren't doing it here. No, unfortunately not. Well, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. Right, right. You know, That's true. You know, in low budget made for TV Showtime movie is probably where people get their start. Like Johnny mm-hmm. Depp. And this was, how long before 21 Jump Street was this? I think about a year before. Yeah, Yeah, not long. This is just a nitpick of the story. So did the guy not pick up the money because he never had any intention of picking up the money? I think so. It just occurred to me, like, because we were just talking about it with the sprinklers. It's like, well, why didn't he come get the money? I think there was a line of dialogue. I know in the book he had a whole reason why he didn't. Well, and then there were also the guys on the... Uh, the dune buggy yeah, the dune or whatever buggies. that was. Mm-hmm. Who showed up. Okay. Because even in the book, they go further with that where the dune buggy people pass the money, turn around and be like, hey, a bag of money. <laughs> and then so all the feds have to run in and say, don't take the money. <laughs> <laughs> and then like you hear some radio report of like, yeah, we saw some guy who was prowling close, but he's running away now. Mm, okay. I think it was he was going to take the money and run away with Lane. But then everything went to shit, and then that's when he changed his mind to, well, we can just inherit this whole fortune. But that was kind of your intention the entire time. Right, right. Or she was supposed to divorce him and get money that way or something. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't quite hold together. No. But it is an interesting scene. And I actually kind of like the, I don't know who the actor is, but the lead fed. I kind of mm-hmm. like the tension chemistry between him and Jacob Ash. Where There was more mm-hmm. chemistry between yeah. them than there was between yes. <laughs> Eric yeah. Roberts and any woman in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. And it was nice where they had this, the fed and the private eye don't get along, but they kind of get along. Mm-hmm. You know, they're helping each other out even while giving each other shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not buying it. I'm not selling yeah. it. <laughs> Melissa, did you see who played the family butler? No. Edward Bunker. Really? The the crime writer. Oh my God. No, I did not catch that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's cute. I really can't even think of anything else to mention about this movie, too, because it's all just your typical plot. Yeah. Yeah, my biggest plot hole is that women keep flinging themselves at Eric Roberts. Yeah. I mean, why? I don't know. I just don't understand. Yeah. 
I'll be honest, this was better than he was like a decade later when he was really heavy into the booze. Because <laughs> you watch his performances in the 90s and he's just like sloshed the oh, entire God. time. Yeah. Have you seen a talking cat? You mean a talking cat? cat? No. Yes, I do mean a no, talking I have cat. Not. No, that would just be sad. <laughs> yeah, well, it is, but I have so many theories about that movie and I'm weirdly fascinated by it. I mean, he's one of those ones where, and again, I think this is the problem of Johnny Depp too, if he's gone so far down a field that it's like, you know, if you would just clean yourself up mm-hmm. and just lay off, but they're not going to because that's so their entire lives now. Right. Yeah. Is their substance addiction. Yeah. yeah. Eric Roberts is a very charismatic actor actor when he's on he could be mm-hmm. really fantastic yeah but it's like you can tell when he's funny i don't really get the sense he was phoning it in in this movie so much as they just weren't allowing him to really just yeah. like i said i feel like it's a direction thing not giving him enough to do yeah yeah, yeah essentially this is not the type of role that eric roberts would necessarily be best suited for mm-hmm. i don't think he's a poor choice like i, he's I don't not a poor choice I don't, i'm just saying yeah. it doesn't play to his strengths I don't think he's a bad choice for like a noir detective. Yeah, no. not but, necessarily this one. But yeah, this one is, I think this character needed to be grimier and grittier. Mm-hmm. You know, it needed to be a little more Spillane, a little less Chandler, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say be a great Spillane detective yeah. who they got a little edge of sadism in there. And I can see him being really unhinged. What was fascinating about reading the book where it was more set among the LA culture was it actually reminded me of some of the early drafts of Ford Fairlane before they just went full comedy with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> no, you and your life <laughs> and the things you know. <laughs> Angie, I know, Angie I know. and I previously I did know, a podcast yeah. on I Ford Fairlane. I know. Yeah. And I, I know, read the source. I, know, I, know, I think Angie uh, is the one who bought me the ebooks of the original Ford Fairlane short stories. Oh, that's amazing. I may have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm an enabler. Hey, you put Dan Waters on something. I'm on it. Oh, yeah, fair. Fair. (laughs) Again, it's just, it's a bland TV movie. I think that's the ultimate big in the short. And it doesn't really have me interested to see anything else that Matthew Chapman did. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't burn it with fire, like terrible, terrible stuff. I just have no desire to like seek any of it out. Right. I wish we knew more of the story. It was enough to put Joel Schumacher Presents at the Mm -hmm. beginning. Like, what was it that he really loved? I don't know. (laughs) And that's the thing is, this was still like before Joel Schumacher had really taken off. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that wouldn't be until... I mean, St. Elmo's Fire did okay. I mean, it wasn't a smash hit. Well, I remember St. Elmo's Fire coming out. It was... It wasn't a smash hit, but it had a certain following. No, it was perpetually at number eight on the box office. Mm -hmm. Like, for eight weeks, it was at number eight. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it did fine. It did fine. Yeah, it had legs in its own way. Yeah, but Joel Schumacher still had not really taken off as a name, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I don't think that would happen until you got to Lost Boys. Lost Boys, right. And then, you know, built on that with Flatliners, and even if you separate our awareness of the Batman movies, he mm-hmm. actually was a pretty named talent for a good seven, eight years there. Yeah, yeah. Because you remember, there was a lot of prestige when he was doing The Client and mm-hmm. Time to Kill and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then Batman happened, but that's right. a discussion for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, though, yeah, that he was putting his name on this. That's why I I have to wonder if he had maybe some more involvement in the project. Because, again, we talked about there's the recurring cast. Mm -hmm. The production designer would go straight from this to Lost Boys. The guy who wrote and directed this would then write a film that Joel almost directed. So there has to be some Mm -hmm. level of tie there. Right. This is where I'm kind of bummed that we weren't able to find Codename Foxfire. Because I'd be interested to see, because if these were part of like a package deal Mm. that he did with Universal, it'd be just kind of interesting to compare the two. A contractual obligation of some sort. Yeah, but you know, Joel never strikes me as someone who does something out of obligation. (laughs) Well, it could be, you know, he was friend of the writer or something and just kind of, yeah, who knows? I mean, it could be that this was something that he was like doing a Jacob Ash adaptation or something that he was circling, but then went off and did Lost Boys instead or... Mm-hmm. Maybe so. Because I think this was so close to Lost Boys that he was already working in development of that. Right. Mm. Right. So, Melissa, anything else you want to add on this one? Not really. I think I hit it all. I do like that they shoot the hero up with heroin and he wakes <laughs> up and his cop friend is like, what's the buzz like? <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. And that's the end of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's that smack there? Yeah. <laughs> I do like that as an interesting way for the villain to put the hero under control. It's like, oh, here's a syringe. Right. Because I think in the book it was chloroform and a lead pipe. Mm. That's not as interesting. Yeah. 
There's something kind of ominous about, once again, if it was a slightly better director, that scene of walking through the warehouse, hearing the flies getting zapped by the bug zapper Mm -hmm. would have been a lot more effective. Yeah. I mean, it was almost effective here. It's like, oh man, I could see the potential of this. Right. Yeah. And I think what was interesting about the book is they focus on the smell and they come around and there's just (sighs) this pile of shit in the corner (sighs) because they had kept the dad there for three days Yeah. while all this was going on. He was still alive. Mm -hmm. And the boy Mm -hmm. had actually already been, it was already dead yeah Mm -hmm. it's not meaty enough it's not gritty enough it's just again it's it's a decent enough plot it just needed to dig into it deeper yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean part of what makes film noir work on the whole at least the noir done in the 1940s and early 1950s is they're dealing with gritty subjects they have to dance around them at some point just because of the studio censorship issues Mm -hmm. of the day So you couldn't often directly talk about drug addiction or anything like that, but they certainly were trying to deal with that in these scripts and just kind of delicately reaching Mm -hmm. into those subjects. And so the way you have to do noir when you do it modern day, you either have to go stylistic go stylistic, or Mm -hmm. go for the gold and figure out how to balance those things. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. this just kind of goes in the middle and it doesn't really work. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I do like the note it ends on Mm -hmm. where she wins. She gets away with it. Yeah. And there's nothing he can do. Mm -hmm. But again, because it's just been such a bland build, it doesn't have the impact. No, it doesn't. Exactly. And it doesn't really make me excited of like, had they kept going and kept adapting Jacob Ash stories or this led to a TV series, I don't know that I would feel compelled to tune in. I'd have to see who's making it. Mm -hmm. Not if it's Matthew Chapman. No. Mm. (laughs) No. I feel like a teacher grading a paper of like a seventh grader watching this movie. It's like, oh, there's effort here. I like these parts. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Better luck next time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, and then all I have left for the episode is I can't do like a full box office release because this was a Showtime TV movie. Mm -hmm. It aired on Sunday, June 29th, 1986. And even just trying to look at TV listings from that time, I could literally only find the three main networks. I couldn't find anything else that was airing. Yeah, I wouldn't think. It's June. It's the middle of summer. Back then, it was just rerun season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was literally up against reruns of Silver Spoons, Punky Brewster, and Murder, She Wrote. (laughs) As well as an airing of the 1985 movie Poison Ivy. Oh, my God. I would have gone for Murder, She Wrote. (laughs) Yeah. And then even just looking just in that one week, what movies were out in terms of what would you stay home or go to a theater? Mm. That week, the top movies were Karate Kid 2, Mm. Back to School. Mm. Which was awesome. Ruthless People. Which was amazing. One of the best comedies ever made. Yes. He may very well be the stupidest man on the face of the earth. (laughs) (laughs) I love that movie. It is a great movie. And that was also the week that Labyrinth opened, sadly, in eighth place. But But it found its audience. I would rather go watch David Bowie juggle glass balls. Absolutely. Wouldn't we all? Yes. (laughs) Yes. If we could spend every weekend just an hour of our lives, just... I feel like the world would be a better place. We need more David... We all need more David Bowie in our lives. Yeah. Yes. But that codpiece shall live forever. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Many young girl became a woman that day. <laughs> I'm guessing not so many did when they stayed home and watched Eric Roberts as Jacob. No. 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 Yeah. no. I'm sure some 12 year old boys got excited if they happened to be flipping through the channels and during that sex scene. It, well, there wasn't that's anything like the, to see. That's the only hot scene. And even then, it's shot in that 80s style of just a lot of dissolves, a lot of blue lighting, close up on the hands holding together. It's literally the way that the Terminator love scene was shot. Well, yeah. I mean, do yeah. I need to lower the age? My point is, is that someone who would be really excited to see a nipple got excited yeah. about that scene. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing it was a double because they are not on at the same time as Beverly Angel's face. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there would be more value for a teenage boy in the scene later where the drug dealer is injecting the ass of Pam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which that was a body double because I noticed they mentioned that in the credits. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> So yeah, I think ultimately slow burn, not one of the highlights. No. No. But again, it's not terrible. It's just, it's a bland TV movie. Very bland. Mm -hmm. Except when Dan Hedaya is on screen, but it's not working in the way it's supposed to. (laughs) No. (laughs) You can see him do that in plenty of other TV shows Oh my God, my heart. Oh, my son, my heart, my son. My son is breaking my heart. I'm dying. Oh my God. (laughs) 
<laughs> Have you seen my arms? They're very hairy. My heart! <laughs> <laughs> if you're a fan of inappropriately cast Dan Hedaya, you need to check this movie out. <laughs> That's there true. Go. That's true. He's not in much of it, but boy, when he's on screen, he's sporadically he's on. used, but they pepper mm-hmm. him throughout just the right amount. Yeah. Yep. Oh man, sadly, I don't think we ever see the scene where he finally kicks it. No. No. Oh, I wanted to see him act that. <laughs> <laughs> but when he feels over, <laughs> so yeah, Eric we... Roberts is doing chest compressions, and <laughs> Lainey is doing mouth to mouth, and Eric Roberts before he starts doing chest compressions he's like having flashbacks to laney kissing him yeah. like, god damn it focus on hedaya focus right. on the dying man in front of you <laughs> chest compressions not flashbacks hedaya to remember oh god <laughs> no wow and then it's like, yeah, literally they find Johnny Depp's body on the scene. And then, of course, you know, the cops are cordoning it off, yet Dan Hedaya still runs into the scene <laughs> to see his son. And he's like, oh, my God. And then, like, clutches his chest and starts flailing about. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, he has this really kind of bonkers pain wail that yeah. he does. <sighs> yeah. Which, yeah. which to, I could do better be when my throat's in better condition. <laughs> to be fair, it, it, I mean, it's not a, like a theatrical scream of agony. And you yeah. haven't no, seen it's a very Hedaya, yeah. <laughs> it's a very Hedaya thing, but also people let out the weirdest sounds in real life when sure, yeah. tragedy strikes. So it's like, right. I can buy that, but boy, Dan Hedaya is running for the hills with that. <laughs> and there's moments where it's like, you know, he's very subdued and quiet and mm-hmm. all that stuff, but then it's like one line will come up and you'll just, you know, we're like, they get the ransom <laughs> call to drop off the money. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, we want to put someone in the car with you. He's like, no, they said not to put anyone else. They told me to go alone. And he's like hitting the table and... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, 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 in the ADR on the voice over the phone. Just sounds like somebody leaning into a microphone whispering on it. Not that they (laughs) altered the audio at all to make it sound like it's coming over a phone. It's just like somebody next to the camera saying, drive down. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. If this movie had been a noir where the leads are Henry Gibson and Dan Hedaya, (laughs) <laughs> and Eric Roberts was the killer. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, Rhea Perlman is the femme fatale. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. This this would be great if you just go all like Zucker and Abrams, just get all these great comedic actors to play it dead straight. Yeah. And mm. it would be hysterical. Yes. <laughs> I like it. So yeah, otherwise I think that wraps up our episode on Slow Burn. So thank you for joining us, Melissa. <laughs> thank you for having me. And again, what are those podcasts we can find you at? A Real Education and A Real Education Noir. Both are available on iTunes. They're available on the internet. They're available on Stitcher. All right. Hooray. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A. C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Shumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Shumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. I think we got more discussion out of this film than it deserved. <laughs> Probably. Of course, there was a whole lot of Dan Hedaya impressions. Dan Hedaya! Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I would love to see Dan Hedaya try to deal with my Skype issues. <laughs> the mouse! It just won't move! It just... It's dragging! I'm trying to move the mouse. I... I... I'm trying to click this button. I just overshot the button. It won't go back around. Me? Can you hear me? Can I, you hear me? I... Can you hear me? I... I, I, wa- I want... My heart... <laughs> I want I want Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dan Hedaya to have a computer <laughs> resolution line. Oh. <laughs> and the two of them trying to fix a computer. I'm serious. You got to get it checked out. I think it's a tumor. It's not a tumor. Not tumor. It's a tumor. I'm telling you, my sister knows these things. It's, it's not a tumor. <laughs> it's a virus. <laughs> get to the chopper. Mm-mm. <laughs> Do you have malware bites? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, and then it just devolves into five minutes of. Alright.
So this is going at the end of the episode. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was almost about to hit stop, and I was like, oh, wait, no, we're doing more impressions. I'm yeah. not going to stop Bits it. Bits are happening. Oh. We need to keep it rolling. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're done, though. I think my throat can only yeah. go so far. <laughs> Noel is spent. Yeah. <laughs>